Welcome. I'm Alex Martin, a faculty fellow in the Anthropology Department at UNH. Thank you for joining this series, Honoring the Mother of All People, Contemporary Indigenous Leadership in Revitalizing Environmental and Cultural Sustainability. The organizers and participants would like to thank the Saul O. Sidor Memorial Lecture Series, the Center of Humanities, and the Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective for this event. This lecture series was established in 1965 in memory of Saul O. Sidor of Manchester, New Hampshire. The purpose of the series is to offer the university community and the state of New Hampshire programs which raise critical and sometimes controversial issue, issues facing our society. The University of New Hampshire Center for the Humanities sponsors these programs. Today's panel is the second event in a series and we encourage you to visit the Center for the Humanities website posted in the chat to learn about the other events. I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that this event is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on the Center for the Humanities website. Audience members' cameras and mics have been turned off by the host. Our panelists will answer questions from the audience toward the end of the program. At the bottom of your screen, there is a button that says Q&A. Please feel free to send in your questions as they come up. You do not need to wait until the end of the event. We would also like to highlight the new Native American and Indigenous Studies minor at UNH. This is an interdisciplinary program that offers a broad understanding of the history, lands, culture, literature, language, and artistic expression, science and technology, race and identity, and political statuses of Native American and Indigenous peoples within and beyond North America. You can find more information about the minor at the link provided in the chat. And now one of our students, Paige Radcliffe, will present a local land acknowledgement. Hello, this event is hosted on Endakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the Alnobak people who have stewarded Endakina throughout the generations. Back to Alex. <laughs> Our moderator today is John J. Daigle, a citizen of the Penobscot Nation and a professor in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine. John received his PhD in forestry from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. John has a diverse research program examining people's interactions with the outdoors and the past few years has been working on a project mobilizing diverse interests to address potential threats from invasive species such as the emerald ash borer, EAB. The research seeks to study and facilitate the ways that Wabanaki basket makers, tribes, state and federal foresters, university researchers, landowners, and others come together to prevent, detect, and respond to the threat of EAB. With an emphasis on application of social science concepts and methods to outdoor recreation and natural resource planning and management. Prior to accepting his present position with the University of Maine, he served approximately 10 years with the National Park Service as a park ranger and US Forest Service as a research forester. Welcome, John. Great. Um, well, welcome everyone. And I'm real pleased to be the moderator of this session. And I, we have three great speakers um, to talk about um, you know, indigenous research practices. And I thought I would just provide just a few um, quotes, uh, you know, in this growing body of, of literature, of um, uh, scholarly literature, indigenous scholarly literature, uh, just to kind of give a feel uh, for some of the presentations that will be um, coming in a few minutes. So again, these are just uh, a few uh, blips here in terms of thinking about indigenous uh, scholarship and research practice. This one's from Burks a body of culturally transmitted knowledge and beliefs about the relationships of living beings, including humans, with one another and with their environment. McGregor states, a system of classification, a set of empirical observations about the local environment and a system of self-management that governs resource use. Kahati, uh, indicates known within all four aspects of being, mind, body, emotion, and spirit. And finally, Hode, factual observations and practical experiences within a historical context, guided by spiritual beliefs and implemented through traditions and cultural stories, interpersonal teaching and practice. And I think these um, 
elements will be reflected uh, with the speakers that we have today. And what I wanted to do is briefly introduce our three speakers. Uh, after I introduce the speakers, I'll have a few discussion questions that I'll form uh, uh, with our speakers. And then we'll open up to questions and answers from the audience, which I hope we have uh, many questions for our speakers. So the first speaker that we have is Natalie Michelle. She grew up on Indian Island and it is a member of the Penobscot Nation. Her parents are the late Dr. Theodore N. Mitchell of Penobscot Old Town, Maine, and Eleanor M. Mitchell from uh, Passamaquoddy, Perry, Maine. Her diverse background includes nursing and a BS in human nutrition and an MA in public administration. Uh, she was a research fellow in the NEST SSI program, a regional research project examining coastal areas and shell fisheries in Maine and New Hampshire. Her interests are in areas of climate change impacts on cultural practices, food sovereignty, indigenous research methodology, and TEK, uh, traditional ecolo ecological knowledge, and language as an adaptive strategy. Our second panelist is Dr. Simone S. Whitecloud, and she is from Lake du Bay Flabeau, band of Lake Superior Chippewa on her father's side and from Vermilion Parish, the heart of Cajun country on her mother's side. She is also a research ecologist at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab in Hanover, New Hampshire. As a community ecologist, she is interested in understanding how plants interact with other plants as well as with humans. Her research has included the study of plant, plant interactions in the alpine regions of New England, deciphering the language of plant communication and documentation of plant knowledge among the Inuit of Southern Greenland. She is currently working to find support to build a platform for sharing traditional plant knowledge and community gardening practices as a means of enhancing resilience and food security for rural and indigenous communities in the far north. Our finalist, uh, final panelist is Suzanne Greenlaw, and she is a citizen of the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians and a PhD candidate at the University of Maine School of Forest Resources. She is an ethnobotanist focused on mobilizing Wabanaki knowledge and cultural practices to address indigenous cultural resource issues, such as reduced access and invasive species planning. And why don't we start with our first uh, panelist, Natalie Michelle, would you like to uh, please bring up your pre uh, presentation? There we go. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, my research was on food security of a coastal culture of the Pescatamugadi, which is uh, the people who spear Pollock and they are located at uh, Pleasant Point or Sibayak, Maine, which is where my mother is from. Next slide. And so basically what I looked at was the historical and the anthropocentric impacts on their cultural customs and their interrelationship and interdependency of uh, linking their food systems with the ecology. And what I came up with throughout my um, study was uh, the implications on that through regulatory control, climate change impact, access to safe quality nutrient sources through the uh, mixed subsistence diet, and the human right to practice their traditional culture by interfacing with the natural world unabated. Next slide. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is really mostly about the epistemology of the Wabanaki and some, of, some central concepts that I developed while working and um, making meaning through my storytelling of my dissertation to help everybody understand a little bit more about Wabanaki epistemology and cosmology. And so basically the, the Wabanaki cosmology, it's a central way of life that includes the paradigm of being a co-participant 
amid a dynamic changing ecology. And it really involves sharing the land and the water with both human and non-human. And this is what I've coined the term holism. And so we have traditional and non-traditional economic systems of food acquisition and food security that includes the cultural practices and utilitarian procurement of culturally important species within the ecology that remains fundamental in cultural survival through recovery, transmission of that um, knowledge to the younger generation and mobilization of that traditional knowledge through um, cultural practices. Next slide. And so here I've depicted the uses of the natural resources by the indigenous communities and how it really, um, the uses of those natural resources um, lends to our cultural identity and our, our solvency as indigenous nations within the state of Maine, we have natural resources being used for food. We used, have them being used for medicines, our plant medicines and animal medicines as well. Uh, the utility through basketry for canoe making or for whatever else that the hunters and gatherers might be using those items for. Um, Others, you know, that hasn't been really identified and looked at as being important to the greater society. Along with being able to interact and interconnect, we teach our value systems, which really fosters the sustainability of not only the natural resources, but our culture. We have ecological stewardship of those different resources that we practice and we use uh, those natural resources as well for our spirituality and our religious practices. Next slide. And so in my research, what I came up with is, is looking at the differences on how indigenous people see the environment, our native values based on our food systems that are linked with the ecology and, um, and our cultural identity. And so, um, so we have the food systems of, you know, the process of acquisition under indigenous values. And we have, um, we have the native values of sharing and cooperation through the, throughout the acquisition process. And in the colonial system, we have through the acquisition of cap capitalism and competition. The procurement we have the reciprocity, the act of adaptive practices, adapt, uh, of giving back um, to ensure the perpetuation of those species for the next seven generations. And when I talk about the seven generations, I'm including non-human as well. In the, in the colonial system, we have extractionism in procurement. Stability, stability of our systems, our food systems, our cultural practices, our traditional value systems. That is a collective endeavor. And, and our, the way the stability is achieved is the transfer of that knowledge to the younger generation. Under the colonial system, we have the stability being from an individualistic point of view. Security, we, we achieve that through a community-based endeavor, community approaches. Under the colonial value system, it's commercially based. Planning, we have long-term sustainability through reciprocity. And this is what I've coined the seven generation policy. And that's ensuring that um, the natural resources are available to both human and non-human. And in the colonial system, we have short-term profits and reward systems through the wage labor. Um, Decision-making, it's locally and collectively controlled. And the colonial system, it's globally controlled through multinational corporations. The distribution of our food systems or whatever else that may be, it's accessible to all community members. And we ensure that you know when when all community members do not have access, then we have a community problem. In the colonial system, it's based on your ability to pay. 
the com consumer system, we have relationship. And then under the colonial system, we have dependency. The TEK and SEK management approaches under the value under the native value system includes responsibility, relationship, reciprocity, and holism. Under the colonial system, we have exploit, dominate, and silo. The nutritional benefits, we have um, quality food sources of culturally significant foods. Under the colonial system, we have suboptimal commercial food sources. Next slide. So what are those factors that ensure um, our people's survival or cultural survival and our individual identity as indigenous people? Well, it involves the access to culturally significant species. It also involves language use and to transfer that knowledge of the environment that has accumulated over millennia to our younger generations. We have our elders who carry that knowledge and then we have stewardship for biodiversity. And in all of that, we have the transfer of TEK to the younger generations. Next slide. And so in caring for the land and the water um, that is linked to our survival as indigenous people, we have the traditional food sources that ensure the continuation of what I call woolly litu, which is living a good life. We have the protection of our ancestral territories for ceremony and spiritual practices. And we have the ecological protection of many culturally important relatives and we do consider them our relatives, both plant and animal. And we call that Katilna Bemkawuk. And that is our word, our traditional word for natural resources. And we protect them from overuse. Next slide. And so some of the multifaceted mechanisms that uh, impact our sociological resiliency not only at Pascatamugadig, but at, at, at Bunawabskeg, at Maliseet and Midakmiguk and uh, Mi'kmaq, it's all the same. It's no different from all of the studies that I've done in every one of these communities. And what we have, particularly in the fishery department, is we have the DMR, the Department of Marine uh, Resources, regulatory control that is really impinging on our resiliency as individual um, na indigenous nations. On top of that, we have the climate change impacts that the tribal members feel that they don't have any control over. And so when you have an organization such as DMR and climate change impacts, controlling uh, how we access the fisheries and what we access and when, then you have this big, area that is pretty much we're not part of that decision making process and this is what we're seeing the access this access can be through loss of habitat it could be a loss of the species or extirpation of the species itself it could be through regulatory control it could be through pollution or red tide for instance that limits that access to that resource and so what we have is we have a very small ability or limited ability to practice our culture and to transfer that important knowledge to the younger generation. And so you have this, all of this large impact impacting our cultural survivability and resiliency. Next slide. And so, and so how do native people think? And this is, this is something that has not been taken in consideration with the federal agencies or with the state agencies and, and, and local non-native people. And this is the concept of holism. And the native people presently feel so overwhelmed with the impacts of climate change and the resources that they depend on out there 
And the reason why they feel overwhelmed is because of this concept of holism that we all carry. And essentially what holism is, is our ways of knowing about the ancient human interactions of the ecology that are really embedded in our sacred teachings of holism or Katona Bemkawag, all our relations of what I mentioned earlier. And it's depicted in the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet language the same way. The Mi'kmaq states it a little differently. Mixic, uh, Nokamak, and Nokamak is really a, a root word for grandmother. Um, holism links the Wabanaki as co participant or co creator through various aspects of individualism, kinship, social cultural ties and the cultural connection to the greater ecology that states essentially what it states is that all life is sacred and interconnected. And this is, this is also the concept that I use in terms of uh, my storytelling and making meaning out of the individual and group testimony of the native people at Pescatamugati. And, and so it's handed down through the generations with values of interrelationship and interdependency that is essentially what other authors have coined ecological mutualism. Next slide. And so in my story work in making meaning in my research design, um, I use the concept of, um, of holism to make meaning um, to validate some of the story work um, as an indigenous method of gaining new knowledge bases. And so um, the process of making meaning through this holistic approach actually provides a form and content that honors individual stories and truths according to the tribal worldview. And this is one of the traditional harvesters here at uh, Pescatamugadi. Next slide. And so in, when I was doing my interviews and my story circles, I had quite a few people there at, and they were all traditional harvesters and some of them were commercial harvesters. And I was really surprised at the turnout and quite overwhelmed. But as we were leaving, I had this one elderly lady come up to me and, and stop and talk to me. And she had the most beautiful face and she, she had to be in her seventies and she still was harvesting in the fisheries herself. And she stopped and she just made this comment to me. And she says, it's not like that we want all the fish for ourselves. All we want to do is to make a basic living and feed our families. We would like to help them. And she was talking about DMR, understand the fisheries better. And so next slide, as you can see, you know, the native people feel that their knowledge is just as important as the scientific knowledge that is out there measuring the fisheries today. And through their own native, what we call native science, they feel that the scientific methods of sustainability of the fisheries is really, um, is really, uh, not meeting um, their standards of sustainability. And so in my qualitative study, I used sort of a, a mixed method of uh, culturally consistent story work or story circles and individual testimony um, concerning the food security of the ocean fisheries at Pascatamugadi. And really what this involves is um, in order to make meaning, I really had to have a, a very strong understanding of the epistemology of the people in which I do have. Um, and you really need to ha have an understanding of the ontology of the people and understanding of how qualitative approaches and data analysis uh, collection works and in order to make meaning out of your story work here. And this is pretty much the basis of indigenous methodology. Next slide. And so what do we do to revitalize that as an indigenous nation? And again, we go back to um, the idea of Wuli Litu, living in a good way. 
to bring back some of our ancestral teachings. Next slide. And so my model was based on the teachings of the seven grandfathers that are not only shared by the Anishinaabe, but they're shared by the Wabanaki too. And they, they are really creation stories that were told by our people a long time ago, BJ, that's a long time ago, to lead the people back to living in a good way through Wulilitu. And these seven teachings are humility, bravery, honesty, wisdom, truth, respect, and love. And each of these were depicted in our sacred relationships with significant animals that made up the traditional clan system of ours and the sacred connection to all of our relations. Next slide. And so the model, I have each of these um, values of humility and also knowing your relationship with life balance and inclusiveness and collectivity. And this is really our community-based approach. And, and in, in the community-based approach, even in research, as you use that, you enter with humility. You enter in order to establish that trust connection with the elders. And not going in like, you know, you're this big researcher and you know it all. Kachichi Tuan is wisdom and it observes all life, prudence, intelligence, and judgments and experiences. And this includes the TEK and the combination of SEK. Um, Sapta Makwasu, I don't use these words all the time. So this is honesty. This is understanding words and actions. And this, this is um, manifest through our co participants uh, co-partnerships, um, our understandings and agreements and our MOUs with state agencies, local agencies and um, other tribes. Kinpihikwal um, is bravery and it's make good choices and decisions and it's learning through the elders and you can see this through, you can, it says vulnerability assessment there. And so when we're doing vulnerability assessments uh, for our natural resources within the community, you not only look at the scientific aspects, but, but you look at the words of the elders and you learn from them. Um, and it may be a choice of you have to do uh, conservation, you may have to do a moratorium or mitigation on certain culturally significant um, species in order to uh, foster or to allow for that uh, next seven generation policy to come into play. Wulamiwagan, which is truth. And these are the earth teachings, the journey, the destination, which really complements the scientific equal, um, inquiry into research and um, environmental management. Kachitamita Haumu is respect the needs of others, the mindfulness, the sharing with all animals, trees, leaves, water, grass, spirit beings, water beings, rocks. And this is built into our strategies for planning and adaptation. Kaseltum, uh, love, it teaches vision, peace and balance of all life. And this is incorporated within our management goals and objectives, which all leads us back to Wuli Litu, live in a good way living in sustainability. And these are basically all our traditional values. Next slide. And so integrating these approaches into a community-based model, we take two primary um, concepts of consensus building and two-eyed seeing that's is a traditional approaches to implementing those um, values. Next slide. And in our traditional consensus building, what it is, is really a mutually beneficial, it ensures mutually the beneficial outcomes for the environment through our stewardship practices that ensure sustainability. And it must be in the best interest of all people. Next slide. And so consensus does not mean that all agree, but that we all understand the decisions that are being made present and future 
are being made for human and non-human. And again, that's our seventh generation policy. Last slide. And so the 2 i c incorporates the TEK and SEK. And what it says basically is that you, as you're seeing through one eye with the best uh, and the strengths of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and you use the other eye to look at the best strengths of mainstream science practices and ways of knowing and combine both of those for the benefit of all. Final slide. And so what my research outcomes came was, came was that, you know, the complexity of these multifaceted aspects, um, you know, are really um, hinders our ability to build mechanisms of socio-ecological resiliency amid these environmental changes and in order to self-determine our tribes. And that these models need to be culturally consistent to guide the co-management and stewardship practice for a more equitable distribution of the coastal uh, fisheries at Pescatamuca, I think. And the community-based models utilizing the indigenous perspective will foster avenues of incorporating these traditional value systems into environmental stewardship through the individual agencies of tribal members and steer towards policies of inclusiveness that are sustainably and culturally responsive. And I thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Natalie, thank you very much for that presentation. So with that, um, Simone, uh, Dr. Simone Whitecloud, would you like to go next? Yes, I'm all ready, thank you. So um, the work I'll be discussing today is um, work that I did in collaboration with Lenore Grenoble, who um, is at the University of Chicago, and she is a linguist and an expert in endangered languages. And the work that we did um, documenting knowledge in Greenland was funded through the National Science Foundation and through the Humanity Humanities Division at the University of Chicago. I wanna offer a little background in how my research in Greenland is connected to the New England region. So 30% of the plants in the Alpine zones of New England are Arctic relics. This means that they were Arctic plants that were pushed down during the last ice age by the growing ice sheet and then as the ice sheet receded, these plants moved north and then moved upslope. So 30% of them are the exact same species that you find uh, in Greenland. During my PhD work on the mountaintops, I came across plant species that were similar to those that I had been taught how to use as medicines from my uncle in California. And given this, I began to wonder if there were similarities between how I learned to use these plants and how they were used by the Abenaki, given that these are their lands. I was told by an Abenaki elder that she did not harvest plants from the Alpine because they were too sacred. Um, but I was still really interested in this idea of comparing uses of plants that I know with uses of another indigenous group. And um, sort of by chance, this opportunity to go to Greenland and work with Lenore fell into my lap through a training program at Dartmouth College. And through that, I was able to pursue this question of how um, our plant use is different from those I know in California and those um, of the Inuit in Greenland. So the Inuit of Greenland are descendants of the Thule people who migrated east from Alaska following the bowhead whale during a periodic, excuse me, a period of climatic warming. Um, traditionally, the Inuit were subsistence hunters with a primarily meat-based diet. Much of their food came from marine mammals and only 5% was plant-based. It is my belief that this 5% represented a critical contribution of nutrition, particularly in terms of plants as medicines. Greenland was colonized by the Danish over 400 years ago. Greenland has been transitioning to autonomy from Denmark since the 1970s. Previous to this, the Greenlandic language was marginalized and all official business was conducted in Danish. The transition to a home rule agreement in 1979 meant that Greenlandic became the official language of education and was the only language used in primary education. 
In 2009, Greenland transitioned to self-rule and Greenlandic became the sole official language. In this same year, my collaborator and I began asking if there was anyone with traditional plant knowledge. We were first told that no one knows about plants. Those are the old ways and Greenland is modern now. The transition to being semi-independent under self-rule made it particularly important for Greenlanders to be seen as modern. However, our contacts at the Hunters and Fishers Association did eventually find a handful of practitioners in the South that were recognized as plant experts. Pictured on the left is the traditional in Inuit attire made entirely of animal skins. And on the right is what's known as the Greenlandic national costume. Um, and although the boots are made of seal skin, um, you can see the Scandinavian influence, particularly in the woman's attire. So in the summer of 2011, we visited two locations to conduct our interviews. The first was Kasiasuk, a sheep herding settlement of 86 people accessible only by boat. And the second was Nanortalik, a town of 1200 people with its own Healy port. We interviewed six consultants in Kasiasuk and four consultants in Nanortalik. We conducted informal, semi-structured, open-ended interviews. The interviews consisted of an open discussion with questions such as, tell us what you know about plants. The second part of the interview was dialect documentation, which is shown here in the photograph. So Lenore is seated with the plaid shirt. Our consultant is in the middle looking at an iPad and I am pictured on the far left. During this um, part of the interview, the consultants were shown photos of 53 species and the names that they gave us were recorded for linguistic analysis. It's important to note that every household had at least one book that described how to identify plants or how to use them. These books were either Greenlandic or Danish. Some shared that the knowledge they had, they remembered learning from their elders, but others specified that they had learned these, this knowledge specifically from books. Uh, we were quite happy with the results that we documented. There were 171 uses that we found and the majority of them were um, medicinal uses, followed closely by food and beverage. Um, I do wanna say that beverage was, a, a common use was teas. So many of these um, plants were dried and, and then combined to be used as teas. Um, a couple of interesting facts. One is for ritual. Um, there was one example of a woman who remembered her great uncle who had been a shaman would uh, burn juniper and use the smoke to clean the air of bad spirits, which is similar to my own family's use of white sage. Um, and then unknown, I thought was also a, a very sort of touching story where she said, I know my grandmother used this plant, but I don't remember how. So I wanted to share with you a, just a case study, so an example of some of our findings, and I wanted to focus on a plant known as, well, scientifically as Angelica archangelica. Um, it's also used in a different species, but used uh, in Chinese medicine, it's known as Dong Kwai, and in Greenlandic, it's known as Kuanak. So um, our findings were that uh, it would be prepared in a marmalade, or it would be candied and preserved. So those are the stalks there. Um, it was also um, used as both a spice and a condiment. So pictured on the left are uh, the leaves of the plant hanging in the two room schoolhouse in that little tiny village of 86 that we visited. And pictured on the right are the seeds from Angelica um, spread out to dry. So in both cases, these would be ground up and then used either as a condiment in a salt shaker on the table or um, sprinkled over food before cooking. Angelica was one of the most important plants used among those we interviewed. It was also an important plant in Danish culture or, or is an important plant in Danish culture. So this picture I took in the duty free part of the Copenhagen airport as we were leaving having conducted our interviews. And so you can see there's a little figurine of Angelica there. 
So the marmalade and sugared recipes are Danish, as is using it as a cooking herb or condiment. So these are not traditional ways of using these plants. Ethnographic accounts describe that the fresh leaves would have been preserved in seal oil for eating during the long dark winters of the Arctic. And although seal and seal fat are still a part of the Inuit diet today, no one reported using the plant in this matter. In terms of the effects of colonialism, the traditional use has been lost and replaced entirely by Danish uses. However, there is still much to be learned and understood from the Greenlandic language itself. Lenore's linguistic analyses provided emergent taxonomies for naming plants. Taxonomy is the system used for naming and organizing the world around you. Her findings showed that um, the names of plants came from classifications based on visual characteristics. So it might be based on the color or the size or the shape slash resemblance to an object or to an animal. And so in this case, I have two examples. On the left is Labrador tea, which folks might be familiar with. It's um, fairly common in the Alpine areas. And then also as you go further north, it was actually used as a stimulating tea um, by early explorers. Uh, and the name of this plant is Kayasak. And that comes from the word kayak or kayak, as you might know it. Um, and this is in reference to the long slender leaves looking like a kayak, as opposed to the plant on the right, um, also a rhododendron in the rhododendron genus is okasak. And this um, comes from uh, okasa, which is uh, for tongue. So these leaves instead are sort of short and fat like a tongue. However, there are also other important lessons to be learned from Greenlandic. One interesting finding from our work centered around the Greenlandic or Kalasisut, which is what they call their language themselves, their name for Angelica, which is Kuanak. So you can see on the top, um, Kalasisut, uh, the name would be Kuanak or um, two other names I'm not gonna try to pronounce. Um, and these were recognized by all the speakers now, what was interesting is that this word has been used for um, years to connote um, the fact that there were friendly relations between the Vikings that were living in the southern regions of Greenland in the late in the 700s, 800 area era, um, that there were friendly interactions between the Vikings and those of Greenland because their word for Angelica um, was Hron or Havnir. And it was believed that Kuanek came from this word, which was based off of the Danish word fjeldkvan. So from Viking to um, Inuit was how the name was believed to have arrived. However, um, our research actually showed that this word is cognate in other languages across the Arctic. So it came from the same source but the name is for a different plant. And so in East Greenlandic, the same word kuanek is for a type of seaweed. And then here's a list of different names that are similar that were used either for a seaweed or in some cases actually for Angelica. And so um, Lenore and I were happy to see that there was a chance that perhaps instead of it being an indication of friendly interactions between um, Vikings and Inuit in Greenland, it was actually an indication that this plant name and knowledge was important enough to have made that migration with the original Thule ancestors um, in 1300 when they were originally following the bowheaded whales to the east and eventually ended in, Grant in Greenland. So some concluding thoughts on plant knowledge in Greenland. Uh, the Inuit in Greenland are reconstructing knowledge of plant uses. The knowledge that they were sharing was often from um, books. And they are not particularly concerned with the source of their knowledge. They were anxious to have the knowledge despite where it came from. And as a result, they were very interested to know my own experience with these different species of plants or things that I had read about other Inuit um, traditions using these plants. And lastly, they are not particularly concerned with spiritual uses of plants, but are very interested in medicinal and food uses.
I did want to conclude um, with one last thought, which is that given the importance of language and autonomy for the people of Greenland, I think I can sum up the message of my talk in two words, language matters. Indigenous languages contain such important information about worldview and understanding and tradition. Beyond the importance of indigenous languages, I wanted to plan a little food for thought. We gather here today to talk about decolonizing science, which I feel is a much needed revisioning for how Western knowledge systems interact with traditional indigenous knowledge systems. However, I was recently at a gathering of the Food Security Working Group with a group of Alaska natives. And one of them pointed out that the word decolonizing has connotations of tearing down and disempowering. She recommended instead the practice of indigenizing science as a much more proactive and empowering vision for the knowledge system we would like to create. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. White Cloud. That was a very, very good presentation and loved your conclusion statement too. <laughs> Um, all right, next I'd like to go to our third panelist, Suzanne Greenlaw. So Suzanne, when you're ready. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a study I work on in Acadia National Park called Restoring Sweetgrass Gathering in uh, Acadia National Park. So restoring relationships, Wab Wabanaki plant gathering in Acadia National Park. I am a co-PI on this research with Dr. Michelle Baumfleck from the United States Forest Service. And this uh, study stemmed from the plant gathering rule for National Park Service. So in 2016, there was a, was a federal rule change. But before that, there was no possessing, destroying, defacing, removing, digging, anything, any plants or plant parts from National Park Service. Some actually nations had some individual agreements, um, but there was no actual um, rule and a, to support those. They were just by the superintendent and with that nation and, and there was nothing actually supporting it in the rule book. So it took a long time to get this federal rule changed. Um, but there were some requirements with this federal rule change where only federally recognized tribes could enter into these agreements. Um, it was a limited to traditional uses. The park superintendent makes the final decision and a big one that we are challenged with is for each species gathered, there's environmental assessment and there has to be a finding of no significant impact to that EA, um, you know, which you can kind of see that might be really challenging because we don't know who conducts these EAs. They may have very limited knowledge of native people. Um, it could be somebody the park contracts out with and they would look to the literature to support these findings. Um, nothing exists or very little, I would say very little um, studies exist that are from a, an indigenous perspective, indigenous led IRM methodology on harvesting, on like, har is, is harvesting sustainable? Uh, so knowing this rule was coming in Acadia National Park where like they were, uh, Rebecca Colwill, who was the chief of natural resources in Acadia National Park um, saw this rule coming and and knew that we would have to do some work to, to formalize these agreements because Acadia is, um, is often seen as an example or a model um, of other parks and especially as high visibility. Um, already actually in that rule change that EA was, was put in there because of um, during the comment period, there's a lot of people, a lot of um, conservation groups that wrote in that was, that was not in favor of this rule change, that they thought that maybe harvesting, just allowing anybody to har any native person to harvest wasn't actually protecting the resource. So knowing that sh she might get FOIA'd or, or you know, there it would be if there's, she wanted to bolster the support for this agreement. Um, and so for Acadia, um, she hired Dr. Michelle Baumfleck to, to do this, to help write the, um, the proposal, as well as a, another botanist in the area called, um, his name is Glenn Middlehauser, and he's really well respected as a botanist for the mid coast Maine. At this point, the, I wasn't a part of the study, and they had written their model uh, under a, a PAR methodology, so participatory action research is how they were moving forward. And Michelle was the one that had more of the experience 
with PAR and Glenn was a, you know, a very well trained in the scientific method. And the reason why I'm telling you that because it will play out later on. So consultation started um, with the Wabanaki nations in Maine and by far overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly people were really concerned about sweetgrass. Sweetgrass, we call it woolly mahuskill, is an extremely culturally, uh, extremely cultural important plant for our communities and our nations and many native nations. Uh, we have this long historical relationship of harvesting in the same areas over generations over and over again. We wove it into our baskets. It's part of our spiritual medicines. Um, and we are, we are dealing with reduced access. So gatherers have expressed um, different in interactions where it was really contentious with a private landowner. We rely on access on private lands, actually usually to cross private lands to get to the salt marsh where, this gra where sweet grass grows mostly. And some people had stories of, of being accosted, of being threatened with guns next time they come, of uh, you know, having dogs come out on them in these areas that they've harvested for generations and generations. Um, so we, and also people talk about not showing this knowledge, not, not passing this knowledge on in these locations because they're afraid. They're afraid of, of if they bring too many people, will somebody tell them they can't go there anymore? If they're too loud, will they be denied access? Um, and, and those interactions, often people will use, will tell them that they are just, they just have anecdotal knowledge, that they don't actually know if they're helping the population, right? People will often downplay indigenous knowledge as not a verified form of science in those arguments. So this is the fast part. <laughs> We're gonna get right to the methodology. We wanted, number one, Acadia didn't know. Um, so I actually started coming at this point. This is where I started joining in. And Acadia didn't know the distribution or the abundance of sweetgrass, right? There had been a couple of botanical inventories of the, of the park, but usually they focused on you know, species of importance, which usually means rare or endangered species. And oftentimes it seems like in those inventories, indigenous perspectives or indigenous, indigenous cult uh, focused plants are left out or, or not in them. So even though they've had two previous botanical studies, they still didn't know where sweetgrass was in the park. And so the first step was to understand the distribution and abundance of sweetgrass. And this is where the botanist had led this part of the study. Um, he had found where sweetgrass was most abundant and then he grid up the salt marsh. Um, this is how he, how he systematically, you know, identified sweetgrass abundance by gridding up a salt marsh into 25 square meter grids. Um, he assessed abundance by he walked through each of these grids and in his assessment rated it either rare, common, you know, those five metrics right there, none, common, occasional, uncommon or rare. And that was over a 25 meter, a square meter area. And this was part of the, this was the PAR aspect where Michelle had written in her part of this research was gatherers were going to come into these 25 meter grids um, and it was predetermined by the botanists. So we would say, they would say, we have this grid for you, come harvest here. Um, and the idea that we would randomly sample or, or ran randomly identify four plots within that 25 meter square grid. And we'd measure stem counts of the pre and post harvest. So this, this research, this harvest research was to support the um, a sustainable harvest you know, findings for EA, the EA. And then we would also interview people on like harvesting techniques, all of the parts of indigenous knowledge, the spiritual significance, cultural significance, um, and just have those conversations. Um, the, I mean, overwhelmingly, like the first time we went out, it just felt wrong. <laughs> like as somebody who's part of the community, these are, you know, these are my family, my, fr my friends. Um, it was really uncomfortable. I didn't like it. I didn't want to be doing it. Um, I actually always would apologize to people <laughs> um, that I would be telling them like these elders who had been harvesting sweetgrass for such a long time, I would tell them where to go. It was just a, a, a break of indigenous protocol 
I feel like. Um, and it didn't work for method wise either for actually the science aspect of it, because where native people would harvest, we could never capture randomly, right? They don't, they, the, they would only harvest in about like in a six meter square area. Um, and that's all they would want. And we were trying to capture randomly, like in a 25 square meter area. It just, it was kind of ridiculous. It was a huge scale issue with how the methods would match up. Match up. Um, it was too controlling. It was not accurate. So we had discussions with the botanists and expressing these concerns because we were the ones that were out with the harvesters, um, you know, saying all that, what I just said. And, but he, you know, he, he's a very wonderful person, but he was still concerned with publishing research, making it um, replicable, right? Making it systematic. Um, and so he couldn't change those methods. He still fought for his approach, which he got his approach from a literature review, right? And so even after we expressed our concern, um, he still wanted to hold on to that sort of systematic approach. And this is what he came up with. These are the grids, these 25 square meter grids. He then identified where the most abundant sweetgrass was in each grid and then did a 10 meter transect. And on that transect, he would alternate these one uh, meter square plots. And then he would um, measure sweetgrass, like this, do the stem count of before and after harvest. Yes, and then also because we had, ex we had expressed what harvesters were saying that sometimes in their harvesting strategies, they would not always come back yearly. It wouldn't be an annual harvest in the same location. He, in his scientific approach, reduced that down to just then this is gonna be an annual and biannual harvest along these transects, right? Some of these transects were harvested annually and we'd measure the, the regrowth and some of them were harvested biannually. And also control plots were established. So some of these were control plots, but, and then, oh so yeah. And so then once these transects were created, we asked harvesters to harvest along these transects and nobody wanted to do that either. <laughs> None of the harvesters wanted to harvest there. Um, and so it felt really disrespectful again, where it felt like they were just paid participants. They actually wasn't, indigenous knowledge wasn't being supported, even though the study was to support a, a, an outcome that would that would severely affect Native people, this, uh, this method, which was really based on his academic training, right? The scientific approach of being unbiased, of um, being systematic, worried about being published. Um, it wasn't actually supporting Indigenous knowledge. So in this discussion, we developed sort of a parallel study where we just identified it as Wabanaki-led, where we, um, we just said, please choose where you want to harvest. Um, and we'll just follow you and ask you questions. And then you can identify a spot and we'll put down this one meter square plot, which become permanent plots. And they harvested in those plots and we counted their harvest counts or their stem counts from harvesting. And then we, um, we also counted the stems that were left in the plot. And these became permanent plots that we visited for two years afterwards. We also established control plots right next to the harvested plots. And, and this, people enjoyed this much more. In this approach, people could express the breadth and depth of their knowledge, right? We, it wasn't being controlled. They weren't put into a, this box where, where they would, har like they were being, they were harvesting places they would never choose to harvest. Um, and so in that, in that emotional experience, they weren't very open, right? If they're not being respected or valued for their knowledge, and they don't really feel like they're an active person, an active part of the study, it, it didn't, uh, didn't, they didn't open up as much about why they do certain things. Actually, we said, well, you know, why would you, because like one, per one person would be like, I harvested really hard here. Um, because I harvested hard, um, oh, I just see the time. We got to go okay, faster. <laughs> um, because I harvested hard here, I wouldn't come back for two years. And they should get to express why and, and all those things, which is a lot of variation between people. And so that variation got captured 
it got understood better. Um, people talked about the permit process, interpretation. So this is like a it's like maybe challenging to see. They're, the scale is off a little bit. They're not exact. So this is where the botanist chose transects, the red lines where people harvested in or where it was chosen for them. And the purple spots are where people chose to harvest with a red spot with a control. So it's slightly different. You can see like in here, people which actually chose the edges more than than in by the channel. And that's because people like a longer sweetgrass generally. You know, this is another overlapping methods imagery. So people, this is what they would prefer. And their length on average was almost like 60 centimeters. And the places that was chosen for them was only about 40 centimeters. And even in areas they wanted to pick in, they, it still wasn't overlapping with the transect. So the pink areas where people chose to pick, and this is the transect that botanists chose. And um, yeah, okay, so I'll say the methods, so the results ended up being very different. In the indigenous led plots, on average, the before harvest um, stem count was about 293. They harvested around 150 stems. On average, after the harvest, there was about 159 stems. And then the next two years, the stem count was up to almost 400 in the harvested plots. So the stem count rebounded up to 30% increase in population. That's from a pre-harvest time to a, um, the next year. But after actually harvesting, it increased 140%. If you went from the number for after harvest, which was down to 159, it would increase almost up to 400 stems afterwards. And in Glenn's plots, the, uh, the botanist led plots, they didn't change at all. They say the same population. So there's no rebounding, but it didn't decrease either. So we're trying to see that how both um, approaches provide different information. And these are the things that when you center indigenous knowledge that, that we found were supported and understood better than, than the sort of the straight scientific method approach of a study like this. I'm gonna move forward because of time. Cautionary tale, really fast. Um, you can find this study in this article I, quote, I, I cited down here. Cherokee Nation, or the Eastern Bannock Cherokee Nation and wild ramp harvest in a Smoky Mountain National, a Smoky, Great Smoky National Park, sorry. Um, a botanist led a study where uh, she didn't consult tribes and she did a different harvesting technique, but in her study found that uh, a gathering 25% of the ramp patch was detrimental to the population and it shut down Cherokee Nation harvesting. And, um, and so they were denied to this traditional practice that they had been practicing for generations based on a one's, oh, sorry, one person's study. And I can't get to that quote because my screen is, anyways, that quote talks about how often, you know, like Western science is privileged over indigenous knowledge all the time. So this is the reciprocity approach where we have these annual meetings um, where research can be updated and comments and concerns. There, we established this working group to struggle through this permit process, you know, where a permit process is a, a very much a top-down management that can disrupt so sort of the indigenous, um, the internal governance that happens in our practice. We have a, we hired a lawyer to write an MOU to assert our sovereignty within this practice. You know, this, this rule is written without us. It often gets put at us, right? We're like told we have to follow this rule. We have very little say in it. So we are writing an MOU that we are to assert some power back and so you have to agree to these things before we are gonna enter in this agreement. This collaborative writing, as well as a opportunity to develop appropriate interpretation. I'm sorry, that was really fast, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Stop saying, sorry. And, um, you know, given the amount of time that we have, the great presentations, I think what I'll do is go directly to some of the questions and answers. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of the questions that have been submitted, <laughs> uh, but I have chosen a few questions that I think um, uh, kind of overlap. Um, so that addresses, I think, uh, multiple submissions. Um, but, uh, and I'm gonna direct it to, you know, one of our panelists, but I do think some of the questions that I've chosen um, are applicable to the other panelists as well if you wanna comment. So uh, this question was uh, directed towards Simone. Do you see ways that learning ethno 
botanical knowledge can be used to help Green Greenlandic youth find their way between indigenous and colonial lifeways. Um, well, I'm biased in answering this because I really love plants and think everyone should know about them. Uh, but I do think that the more that the Greenlandic youth can identify with their identity as indigenous people, the better. Um, that's actually been sort of a sidebar. One concern is, you know, if you look at young people texting, which is what they do, they're texting in Danish. So even though Greenlandic is their first language, um, that's starting to get eroded now that we have this new technology. So um, I do think um, most youth are involved in the subsistence hunting practices. You know, they have, every family has a, a um, camp, a hunting camp, and they are a place where they go to harvest berries, for instance. So um, I think the more that that can be a reality, the better. And thanks for the question. Natalie um, or Suzanne, would, would you like to reflect on that type of question just with the process of research? Um, engagement of research and its connection to perhaps the youth empowerment of the power of language or the power of a practice, how that's impacting um, youth? Well, I think from coming from a health perspective, um, you know, it, it, it is um, an issue of the youth not feeling connected to their culture and uh, the loss of identity. And this is a direct link to the, the rates of suicide in our communities. And so I think, yes, the more that they communicate, uh, I mean, connect to the culture and the cultural teachings, the more resilient and, and strong and self-realization will take place in our youth. Suzanne? I'm sorry, will you say the original question again? Uh, yeah, the, the original question was, do you see ways that learning ethnobotanical knowledge can be used to help Greenlandic youth find their way between indigenous and colonial life ways? Yeah, I do. I think, um, I think more, kind of along what Natalie said, the, the when we bolster our own communities, when we feel a pride in this knowledge base and we can show, we can um, shift language and empower our own language and ourselves from a place of being like, even with, I know, like with basket making, when you look at the old writings about it, not that long ago, they would call Native people peddlers, right? That's a non-Native person writing about Native people, calling them peddlers instead of it's actually this form of, of cultural survival and cultural res resiliency. Um, and I think it takes native people to write about ourselves in a way that we empower our own communities and the people around us. Um, I said that to my mother-in-law and, um, and she, and you could see the change. She's like, that's right. We, that was that, wasn't it? Instead of kind of being shamed by our cultural practices. Um, so I, yeah, I do think that our own writing about ourselves where it's empowering to our communities is really important. Good. Thank you. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that the three of our panelists are female, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in studies that are, you know, work that's being done in the community and engagement. And um, I wondered if you could reflect on that in terms of thinking about um, you know, encouraging higher education, maybe more research that not only within the, you know, the community, but can benefit society more at large. Um, do, you, do you see younger, a role of younger women and um, empowering them with doing more research within the community and so forth? Anyone can take that question. <laughs> I'll jump in real quick. So my first thought was, well, you know, the work that we're talking about here is interdisciplinary, right? We're, we're being boundary spanners, we're crossing Western science with traditional science. And so my thought was like, well, women are better at multitasking, right? So it kind of makes sense that as we're going on this journey of trying to bring all these different things together, that it would appeal to us and that we would be successful in doing it. 
So I hope we continue to see lots of females, although males are invited too, um, but continuing down this trajectory. Any thoughts you want to share, Natalie or Suzanne? Well, I just feel, you know, it's a cultural thing too. I mean, it's no big surprise to me that we're all women and in presenting uh, indigenous research. Uh, women have always been the backbone of Native communities, and we have always taken the lead, and we've always been the teachers. And, um, and so um, it's part of, I think, <clears throat> our female, um, our gender responsibility to our communities is, is to make sure that they're taken care of. And I think that that's why you see women here today. Yes, Natalie, and you are recognized as a language keeper. And <laughs> it just as Simone talked about, the, the, the embedded meaning in the language is so, so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Suzanne, did you want to add any thoughts? I think Natalie did a great job. And Simone did a wonderful job, too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good. Um, I'm sorry that I could only ask a few questions if we're if we're needing to end this webinar at 5:28. Um, so I do want to um, thank everyone, you know, that was part of this webinar today, and uh, I I want to thank everyone for that. Uh, you can visit the Center for the Humanities website for information on upcoming events in the Sador series. Uh, the recordings of tonight's event will, event will be available soon on the website. And, um, and that, will be, that will be available on the, on the website. So thank you. Thank you panelists for, for your presentations and thank you everyone who submitted questions and, and, and we're, we're here today for the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, John, for hosting, and thank you, Sidori, for having us. Yes, and thank you, everyone, for coming.